So today afternoon, we're joined by a well-known Kenyan uh, academic and an expert on politics and governance, Dr. Peter Kagwanja, uh, who is also a founder of, uh, of the Africa Policy Institute. Uh, we're very happy to have you at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Thank you. Right. Now, we're going to talk about the Kenyan election. You know, there's a lot of media focus on, on the elections. And uh, um, we just, um, um, you know, would like to know, um, what makes this upcoming election so critical? Uh, why is it so important? Why should we pay attention to it? Uh, I think we should pay attention to this election because of the possibility of uh, violence. Uh, possibility because since uh, 1991, when Kenya returned to multi party democracy, uh, elections have been uh, plagued by cycles of violence. And even when there is no much violence at the national level, as the case was in 2002 and 2013. Uh, local violence take place within uh, counties and, you know, wards, and taking a heavy toll as it does at the national level. So it is important to focus on this election to ensure that the 2017 polls are peaceful and you know, transparent, and therefore to help entrench democracy in Kenya. As you know, Kenya is a very uh, critical state uh, in the Horn of Africa region, has been widely embraced as a pivotal anchor state uh, in matters, peace and security. It is also a regional economic hub, uh, currently the fourth largest economy in Africa, growing at a rate, a rate, an annual rate of 5.5%. Uh, it also looked at in the future as one of the major uh, partners uh, of major players uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a really part for companies both in the West and the East that are investing on the continent. It's, it's essentially the gateway to the eastern uh, part of the Indian Ocean. And finally, the country is a very, very important strategic partner to America and, uh, and the West in the war against uh, violent extremism and terrorism uh, in Africa generally, but more specifically in the Horn of Africa. It has also been involved in conflict resolution and mediation in countries like Sudan, uh, South Sudan, Somalia, and Burundi. And therefore, it is important that Kenya remain stable that it may continue to be a critical partner to the United States uh, moving forward into the 21st century. Right, now you talk about uh, conflict, um, you know, the cycles of conflict uh, that were there in previous elections, uh, such as the election in 2007. What uh, factors will need to be in place to ensure that this doesn't happen uh, again? Um, the, the approaches to conflict in Kenya by it can, the country's external partners have largely focused on the short-term intervention, basically uh, very reactive rather than long-term. Uh, my Our suggestion in, the, in our discussion today was that we begin to look at Kenya as a country that has been going through almost the three decades of raw intensity conflict, which tend to escalate uh, during elections, but it is always there in the in the background. Therefore, measures taken must not only address the, conflict, the, the root causes of conflict for 2017, but also look at 2022 as, as another area when we might get another uh, similar cycles or, uh, cycle of conflict. And measures here would basically include um, talking to the main players, the two political formations that are there, um, to basically commit themselves to conduct uh, themselves and the election in a peaceful manner, non, uh, commit themselves to a non-violent approach to any dispute that might arise from the, from the conflict. Most of the issues, the, the so-called root causes of, this, of, of violence in Kenya, uh, were addressed largely uh, as part of the mediation uh, of the 2008 uh, conflict. Uh, 
and they were all captured in a capsule in the new constitution, uh, which addressed issues of uh, sharing of resources, sharing of power from the top to the bottom, and all that was captured in the devolution system. But what we observed in the discussion was that devolution itself has come up with new challenges to uh, stability and, and violence in, in, in the coming election. And it, therefore, arguably, we have not only devolved power and resources, but we have you know, also devolved the, the burdens of national uh, the burdens of national government, uh, particularly uh, the, the, the propensity to conflict during elections. And the argument was made convincingly that uh, whereas the 2007, I mean the, the 2017 election uh, may not be as intense as it was in 2007 at the presidential level, we have a new frontier of of violence in the counties and, and at the wards, mainly because of the new stakes that have gone up as a result of these jobs, almost 1,800 of them paying so well uh, that the competitions are high and the, 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 the rivalry between those who are holding office and those who want to, def to, 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 get, to get them out of offices I mean, it becomes intense. And, and therefore, addressing these issues is going to be critical. We've got to shift the focus, not only from the presidential election uh, to the primary, uh, I mean, uh, no, not only from the presidential to the county elections, but to begin to look at what the primaries have meant uh, for the coming election in terms of what we've seen in the counties happening, whether it's going to intensify as we get closer to the new election, you know, on August 8th, uh, 2017. Now, Dr. Kagwanja, I wonder if uh, you could say something about um, ethnic mobilization, because this, is a, this has been a, a key feature of Kenyan elections in the past. I mean, if we look at what happened in 2007, but even in earlier election cycles, uh, what might be done to ensure that this problem does not uh, surface again uh, this time around? Uh, I, I think the... The ethnicity in Kenya must be conceived for what it is. First, we, 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 what we are talking about is political tribalism, meaning mobilization of politics uh, along ethnic lines and playing on ethnic fault lines to create communities of grievances, uh, which become like war formations in, 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 and basically tend to uh, almost uh, you know, inevitably lead to uh, uh, conflict at different uh, degrees. The, what we have not talked about, and we, 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 we don't normally talk about, is moral ethnicity, which is basically the, 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 the benefits that come from belonging to an ethnic group. Uh, the, the, the welfare role played by uh, these, these uh, I mean, identities in terms of helping members uh, in hours of need, particularly in countries where 40% of the population is be living below poverty line. It becomes a very good instrument for mobilization. But it is not that mobilization to basically pull people out of poverty and address their own, uh, you know, address the, sh the shortcomings of the economies. But it is uh, the use and misuse of people uh, uh, and voters in, uh, by the power elite in order to uh, put them to power. And what that has, that has happened uh, from the early years, and we, we begin to see that the, the, the Kenyan politics is essentially a competition, not of ethnic groups, but uh, formations, ethnic, uh, formations of multiple ethnic groups that coalesce into uh, political parties. Uh, if you look at Kano in the 1960s uh, and Kando, the Kenya Africa Democratic Union in the same time, these were two formations, not one ethnic group, not two, but a number of ethnic groups coalesced into these formations. The same case happened in, in the rise of Kenya People's Union in, in the late 60s. And we see the resurgence of the same formations after 1991, when Moti Party came. And the divide and rule strategy by Kano 
in order to remain in power, deep, basically entrench the politics of political balkanization. And that balkanization did not consolidate party formations, but basically polarized populations. And, and therefore, our focus should be on how do we allow political formations to get roots as instruments of democracy, as ways and means of deepening the country's young democracy, without at the same time that polarizing element of ethnic mobilization. Uh, it is very clear that Ken uh, politics in Kenya revolves around five ethnic groups, the so-called Big Five, that constitute about 70 percent of the of the voting power in the country. These are the Kikuyu, the Ruya, the Ruo, the Karenjin, and the Kamba. Between those groups, they they constitute between 70 and 75 percent of Kenya's voting power. And therefore, the puzzles that are brought together in terms of ethnic, uh, I mean, horse trading, and forming I mean, uh, uh, formations that fight national elections, ha can directly tell us whether or not a certain election is going to be intensely violent or it is not. For example, the, 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 the 2000 uh, and two election uh, had two aspects to it, which would, be, would inform why there was no violence at that time, intense violence at national level, which is basically that we had the Karenjin and sections of the Kikuyu in one camp and the rest of the communities, including the three quarters of the Kikuyu on the other hand. And the, the two candidates actually came from the same ethnic group. So very quickly, the political, fa the, the, the identity, ethnic identity gave way to uh, other forms of identity, particularly a generational identity. So the 2002 election was, did not revolve around the axis of ethnicity, but the axis of generational politics, one young and one old. The 2013 also was not violent. Uh, at the national level, but was intensely violent at the, at the regional level, in Masabit, in Tana River, in parts of uh, Maasai land, or, you know, uh, which basically Narok and, and uh, to an extent uh, Kajiado, uh, this, this was a very uh, violent election uh, because of the rise of counties and the need to share power at the county level, and not only sharing power, but with the pros prospect of sharing resources. Uh, so th that, 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 uh, that's how these formations have come up. Now, as we approach 2017, you will notice that we have two formations, one predominantly Kikuyu Karenjin and another one which is uh, supposed to be predominantly Ruo, Kamba, and Ruya. Now, Jubilee itself is, of course, um, manipulating, I mean, or playing with the situation in order to win votes across the board. But the determinant factor are not going to be this big five. It's the, the lower tier of communities that constitute about 60, six, five to six percent of op population uh, at the, individ at the uh, individual level. For example, the Meru, the Kisi, the Mijikenda at the coast, and uh, co collectively the Maasai and the Trukana and the, and, 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 and the, and the Somalis who form the pastoral coalition. Now, the, the interesting bit in this is that uh, how these formations are going to mobilize that vote is going to determine whether the election is going to be peaceful or not. Uh, if there's intense use of negative rhetoric, uh, playing uh, uh, with wedge issues, in other words, the fault line issues that, gener I mean, uh, that generate gr uh, uh, grievances, then it, we are likely to see a very volatile uh, kind of electoral, electoral season. Uh, but it is important for uh, both Kenya, the government, the opposition, and the international community to do everything possible to ensure that uh, Kenya that does not huddle down to uh, another 2007 20, uh, 20, and uh, 2008. Now, um, Kenya is very well known for developing um, indigenous early warning systems uh, during moments of crisis. 
how well are these uh, systems working right now in the context of the election and uh, um, how resilient uh, will they be in uh, preventing election related violence one thing is clear <coughs> that the, the the coalition that is ruling uh, I hazard to say that it's not what you'd call your kind of a coalition that is based on like-minded and friends and all that camaraderie kind of uh, arrangement. To, I like seeing it as a truce between two groups that basically fought in 2007-2008. And therefore, Jubilee, in a sense, is a conflict resolution uh, framework. Uh, just as the constitution, the new constitution was crafted as a, as a framework to address the spectrum of grievances that emerged uh, in 2008 and, and, and stopped the violence that we saw. And therefore, the good thing is, is that Jubri seems to be holding together as a coalition. And that in itself is very, very critical. Because it is the grievances of the, of the current gene who had been in power for 24 years and who were swept out of office by the, the NAC coercion. And they developed a deep sense of grievance that the new government that was elected in 2002 basically ran, ran their people out of major jobs in the military, in the civil service, in, 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 and also uh, denied them business opportunities and locked them out of major lucrative opportunities in the government. Therefore, 2007 was an, an attempt for the current in, in a large measure to reassert themselves in, in the national politics. And they came with, with, uh, with vengeance and, and bitterness. And th that is what you see uh, in the kind of violence that we witness in the Rift Valley. Uh, and therefore, coming together with, with the Kikuyus, uh, has meant that uh, at least one problem is solved. The next thing is, how do you ensure an inclusive government after 2017? Because two communities cannot form, you know, cannot uh, convincingly, uh, you know, represent a nation where we have 43 communities or so. Therefore, Jubilee itself has been conscious of this fact, the need to be an inclusive political formation. And that has helped a lot in terms of the transformation from the Jubilee coalition to uh, Jubilee party, uh, which meant dissolution of about nine uh, ethnic-based parties into one solid party, and also uh, inclusion of other non caring and non, you know, uh, Kikuyu uh, political organizations uh, within that, either as, Ru as a Rus coalition or affiliated uh, in one way or another, or collapsed into, uh, into one party. That has been very helpful. Uh, that analysis is very critical because it is, you can take this to the bank that it to the, at the presidential level, uh, you know, conflict is, is likely to be there, dispute over results could be there. If the electoral management institutions are not trusted and don't seem to be doing a credible job, but the intensity and the destructiveness of that of whatever form of violence might appear is going to be extremely low uh, because of just the ethnic alignment. The, the Kambas traditionally don't go to the streets. They, they wage their grievances using other channels. And therefore, we are only left with one community which will naturally or somehow get uh, to the streets if they feel that uh, the, the, the election was not you know, credibly uh, managed. Uh, but again, th that, that itself is easier to address rather than when you have uh, two communities, as we had in 2007, basically focusing on another, uh, the, the, the famous 41 against, uh, against one, uh, which basically stoked the, the, the kind of sentiments that divided politics during that time. So 2017 is likely to be an easier one to handle at the presidential level. I cannot say the same for the county level elections. And therefore, the international community, 
uh, and the Kenyan government and any other player seeking to prevent, uh, you know, the violence in Kenya should focus on the region, at the regional level, at the low level. And we have already witnessed through the primaries, uh, which were perhaps Kenya's most violent and most chaotic ever. Uh, reason being, uh, occupants of those seats for the first time are paid salaries that are higher than those of senior civil servants. Uh, 300000 which is about $30,000, uh, plus allowances amounting to, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, 5000 I mean, $50,000, and other privileges, which in total would bring about $10,000 for a seat that for the, in the past has never received any uh, form of income. Also, when you come to the governors, we are going to almost $20,000, the whole package, and the senator almost the same, a women rep almost the same, and, and these are 1,800 positions that have emerged, and the intensity of conflict uh, and tensions are very high, particularly in those areas which are considered uh, party strongholds. We have this early warning information. It is how we are going to deal with it, which is important. And there are very many indicators that, uh, you know, the, the Kenya has the capacity to deal with this. Uh, there are indicators that the region and Kenya's international partners, uh, the international community, are already aware of these particular uh, possibilities. And I think that's why we held this meeting today. Now, um, you talked about... Uh, uh, institutions, um, the Electoral Commission, the Judiciary, the police, um, how independent are they? Certainly, what is the perception of the ordinary voter uh, about these uh, uh, institutions? And uh, is there any uh, difference in the way in which they are perceived now and the way that they were perceived, for instance, in 2013 or 2011? Uh, Paul, I think we, we, we really need to address this issue um, uh, head on because uh, in today's debate there were two views that emerged. That one, the Kenyan security is too weak uh, to intervene uh, effectively in, the, the, in, the, in case violence erupted in 2017. I made the point based on my consultancies, my study uh, of in, uh, of security dynamics in, in other areas beyond the conflict uh, for, I mean, dynamics that we are focusing on, that for the first time since independence, Kenya has the strongest, well-equipped, and the largest security uh, force, uh, and also law enforcement force, giving it capacity to deal with the 2017 uh, you know, uh, protests or violence, whatever form it might take, including criminal violence that uh, if it occurs. Now, the, the forces, particularly the, 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 the military, has traditionally been known across the world to be extremely professional and neutral, uh, trained and socialized in uh, very professional spaces like the, the American National Defense College, I mean, University, where we are today. The, the many of the senior officers of Kenyan military are lowlits or you know, of this, these particular institutions in many ways. The, the police, on the contrary, is perceived traditionally as a very corrupt force. Uh, there are other neutral forces which even if they wanted, they, they cannot get into contact with corruption because they are not reviewing the people they, they do. That's the general service unit, which is the, normally the one that intervenes in cases of chaos, uh, not the regular police. Uh, the security reforms uh, after 2010 have created a new force called the, the provincial, I mean, uh, the, 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 the call it, the, 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 it's basically focusing on the national uh, you know, administration. Uh, so it's an administration police, uh, which is perhaps a, a larger contingent now, uh, you know, uh, almost the, the same numbers as the police. 
and again, these are not in contact with, with the civilians uh, where they have interactions that would enable them to be corrupt. So the, the focus on corruption and inefficiency and, in, and so on basically is on the regular police who are on day-to-day -day basis dealing with the public in, in traffic, in looking at uh, crimes and so on. So for then again, that is also uh, being addressed. So the, the capacity of a co combined administration police, the general service unit, and the military is largely neutral and professional. Kenya today has the largest per capita you know, distribution of the security forces, a very conscious process adopted after 2013. I made the point uh, very assertively that the country is reaping the dividends of the campaign against Al-Shabaab because the, the attacks by Al-Shabaab in churches, schools, hospitals, public spaces, markets, uh, public uh, transport system and buses, drew Kenya's attention to its own vulnerability to militias, uh, criminal uh, groups. Uh, in fact, during the, the 2013 uh, attack on, on Westgate uh, Mall uh, in Nairobi, it is said, and, and I think there is truth to it, that uh, security, various segments of security forces are uh, shot, shot at each other. Today, we have a very well coordinated and centrally uh, you know, organized uh, security uh, process. Uh, we have, you can already see there are street cameras to, to even det detect people inside their vehicles. Uh, if you look at the way, when you're getting to the, to, to the Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, you were checked of any kind of harmful item you might be carrying, uh, you know, kilometers away from the airport so that you cannot get to the vicinity of the airport with that kind of a thing. It is that kind of security alertness, that awareness, that capacity which the government uh, can draw upon in terms of dealing uh, with, you know, ensuring that, uh, you know, protests or violence does not get in hand. In other words, we have state capacity to enforce law and order. The fundamental question is not there. The, que the question is whether in enforcing law and order, the forces will adhere to the, the rule of law and operate within a human rights framework. That is what needs to be watched. And I think that's where civil society organization and others will have to watch. Of course, the government is aware that it's under watch. Now, the other thing we can point uh, also related to that is that 2008 violence was largely an indication that the government had lost ground to, prolifer uh, to, to a proliferation of militias, vigilantes, and criminal gangs which were hired by politicians to basically wage war within Nairobi, its environment, and in the, local, in the rural areas. Since 2014, we have seen a, a deliberate move by the government to reclaim its um, uh, monopoly over legal instruments of violence. We are seeing an effect, uh, the rise of an effective state that can enforce law and order within its own boundaries. Uh, the one which has minimized the role and effectiveness of vigilantes and militias that are in private hands. And therefore, that itself is a good guarantee that the violence is likely to be, to take a very low key uh, in 2007. Uh, and, and, and therefore, what I think should be the role of the international community in this regard is basically to get the various players to commit themselves to a peaceful uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, election. But more importantly, to build the capacity of these, of, of, to help the government build the capacity of these forces to operate within a human rights framework, because that is critical. Also, to work resolutely to root out the culture uh, which has been described by some scholars as 
uh, oligopoly of violence, means the diffusion of violence into society that makes it very difficult to maintain law and order. Uh, that it has done, but it also need to deepen uh, that whole process. Uh, and, and, and I think the, we, we, we have a very good, uh, in the, we beginning to have a very good sense of, uh, of the Kenyan security forces. The, the, the question was raised during debate about the increasing role of the military in internal affairs in Kenya and whether this is compromising its own tradition of professionalism. Uh, the answer is no. Whereas individual retired military officers might play a high profile role uh, in which might appear partisan, within the, the forces, the forces remain very, very neutral. Now, when they intervene locally, they are under what we call civilian, uh, you know, uh, governance. They, 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 take, they, they take their cue from the civilian government. And what does that mean? The minister, the principal secretary and finance officer within the Ministry of, Foreign, of, of Defense must be civilians. And, 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 and the, therefore the military architecture falls under that. Uh, moreover, the military cannot, wage, cannot undertake any operation within the country without the outright and express uh, authorization by parliament, and which is clearly defined in terms of its duration and, and the, the focus of its operation. Uh, and therefore, again, in this particular regard, the focus will be on uh, whether or not uh, the, uh, such interventions are, uh, occur within a human rights framework. And I think the government is conscious that it is, it is a need to uphold uh, human rights. Right. Well, it's uh, definitely an important country, very important issues, and these are things that we're going to continue uh, to watch very carefully. And uh, we'll definitely uh, reach out and uh, continue talking to you as we uh, prepare for these uh, very, very important elections. So we've been talking to Dr. Peter Kagwanja, a very well-known uh, Kenyan uh, scholar, uh, founder of the Africa Policy Institute, uh, who was uh, very kind to spare some time uh, to come and see us at the Africa Center. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Mm.